Good evening and welcome to Chicago Tonight, Latino Voices. I'm Phil Ponce. On the show tonight, what the elimination of cash bail will look like in practice following a historic Illinois Supreme Court ruling. An investigation explores allegations of sexual abuse in U.S. immigration detention facilities, a look at what was uncovered. Pilsen's historic Latino festival, Fiesta del Sol, kicks off this weekend as it celebrates 51 years. And the work of a Chicago-based photographer who's documented Cuba for decades, featured at a new center for photojournalism. All that coming up, but first our sto top story tonight, ending cash bail in Illinois. We explore what that will look like right after this. Chicago Tonight, Latino Voices, is made possible in part by the support of these donors. Illinois is set to become the first state in the nation to entirely eliminate cash bail. This after the Illinois Supreme Court up upheld a contentious portion of the criminal justice reform law known as the Safety Act. It'll take effect statewide beginning September 18th. But what exactly will this historic measure look like in practice? Joining us now with more are Errol Loudermilk. She's chief of staff for the Cook County Public Defender's Office. And Ed Rendon, she's Vice President of Immigrant Justice at the Resurrection Project. And thank you both for joining us. Uh, Era uh, Loudermilk, if I can begin with you, uh, just take us back and tell us why the push for the end of cash bail to begin with. You know, thank you so much for having me on. I have to say, this is a proud moment for our state. Illinois is really leading the way in the country with uh, systemically addressing harms that come from our pretrial uh, legal system. And I say harms because that was really what was the impetus behind the push for this. It's the harm that we've seen that pretrial incarceration does to members of the communities, to families. Um, you know, in our current system, a lot of people are held pre-trial simply because they didn't have access to the financial resources to pay for their bond. Um, and you know, that decision to make them pay for their bond is, is often made in a very quick bond court hearing. And, uh, you know, a judge has the ability to very quickly make a determination about whether or not someone is held pre-trial. You know, let's uh, if I may interrupt, let's let, let's take a very quick look at some of the other provisions of the law, Ms. Loudermilk. As I mentioned earlier, the five to two Illinois Supreme Court ruling says the elimination of cash bail is now constitutional. And this graphic explains what that uh, will entail. The those who are arrested will appear before a judge for an initial hearing. Prosecutors can request a detention hearing. The decision is then made at the judge's discretion. And if the defendant does not pose a safety or flight risk, then they will be released without jail. Uh, era, era louder milk, if I can stay with you briefly, what does this decision now mean in practice? How, how is it going to work? I mean, in practice, it means that we're going to have a much more um, intentional hearing process where a judge can evaluate in a much more meaningful way whether or not an individual poses a significant risk to the community and that will be the decision for whether or not they're held pre-trial. Um, you know, in our current system, if that determination is made and someone has access to resources, they're able to pay a cash amount and buy their freedom. That's not going to be the case under the new law. Uh, you know, money is completely removed from the equation. Instead, there are other conditions that a judge may impose when he's making a consideration of whether or not um, this individual poses a a threat or a risk to safety in the community, and they can impose other conditions to try to preserve community safety um, when they make the determination that pretrial incarceration is not appropriate. 
Ere Rendon, uh, your team works closely with the immigrant community. How is the old system affecting immigrants? Yeah, so several dozen organizations um, that serve immigrants, including the Resurrection Project, you know, have been um, active in supporting um, ending cash bail um, precisely because, you know, uh, oftentimes um, detaining folks before pre-trial, before pre-trial, um, you know, independent of whether they're guilty or innocent will lead into harsher convictions. Um, and harsher convictions really have um, a really bad effect in the immigrant community, oftentimes leading to deportations, um, even for folks that are legal permanent residents, for instance. And so we want to make sure that folks are able to, regardless of whether they can pay or not, um, that they're able to consult with an attorney. Um, and oftentimes for immigrants, it means consulting with both a uh, defense attorney, but also an immigration attorney. Errol Loudermer, if you alluded to the fact that a judge still has uh, uh, control regarding whether a person should, uh, should or should not be released uh, before trial, uh, r remind us, what, are some, what is that process like? For example, what are the offenses uh, for which a judge can decide, no, this person is not going to be released? Yeah, so there are several categories of offenses that are built into the law, um, you know, that were a result of years of careful thought and negotiations with law enforcement and other court stakeholders. And, you know, the system was really designed to really prioritize safety and community safety. So some categories of offenses um, would include all non-probationable offenses um, that are for gun-related felonies, you know, all stalking charges, sex crimes, all domestic violence charges, all forcible felonies. So there are several categories of offenses um, where the state may ask a judge to consider holding somebody pretrial based on the potential harm to the community. And Ed Rendon, as you know, notwithstanding that uh, that for want of a better term, safety measure on the part, uh, safe, the role that the judge plays. There are still many critics who say, notwithstanding that, a lot of dangerous people are going to be on the street as a result of this change. How do you react to that? Yeah, we've been actually having a lot of listening sessions along with the uh, Chicago Community Bond Fund in our community, um, where what we're doing is we're bringing folks um, and listening to those concerns and then talking about what it actually means, right? This bill does not make it so that folks that have been convicted of a crime um, are let, you know, are are are, are um, given freedom. Really, what it is is that it's saying that at least at the pre-trial, before you are, you know, either before you're convicted, everybody will be treated the same. And I think fairness is definitely a value. Um, that, you know, we can all um, respect. Um, and when we're able to have those conversations and folks understand, um, fairness definitely wins. Era Laudermilk, uh, how about your response to that? Because as you know, uh, there are some prosecutors and many people in the law enforcement community who have been just so strongly against this. What do you say to them about the prospect of dangerous people being put on the street? You know, I think that the, the, the thing that really stands out to me is the fact that there's this misconception that, you know, incarceration makes us safer. It really doesn't. Actually, incarceration makes our communities less safe. There's a direct correlation to holding somebody pre-trial and the harm that comes to the community. You know, when you hold someone pre-trial, you're reducing their access to a job housing and other important stable resources that really do make communities safer. So, you know, there's just been this misconception that incarceration in and of itself is going to make communities safer. And that's just not true. And that's not what the data shows either. Era, uh, era, uh, hold on. Uh, what does the data show, Era uh, Loudermilk? Well, it shows that when people are incarcerated pre-trial, they're you know, when they're removed from their economic stability, um, you know, one, they lose their jobs. So when they are eventually released, most of them a year later remain unemployed. And when you're unemployed, then that perpetuates the likelihood that you're going to create, commit a crime in order to survive and that lands you back into the system. So actually incarcerating someone actually increases the likelihood that someone, um, 
will be brought back into the system later because of that economic instability that pretrial incarceration results in. Whereas there, people who are and not it, detained pretrial, sorry, if I could just get this out, people who are not detained pretrial have much better outcomes. And, um, you know, that is one of the reasons why we push so hard to have the systemic change. I'm afraid we're out of time, but I appreciate uh, both of your insights, Era Loudermilk and Ed Rendon. I thank you both. Thank you. Thank you. And up next, the tales on an investigation into sexual, uh, sexual assault claims inside ICE detention facilities. So stay with us. CBS News, our producer Zabo Warsi has been investigating sexual assault claims in immigration and customs enforcement facilities since 2021. As you may know, these facilities are also known as ICE detention facilities. She teamed up with Latino USA and Futuro Investigates to tell the stories of three migrant women who alleged they were sexually abused while in ICE detention when they were at their most vulnerable in a medical center. The investigation reveals how ICE has done very little to stop it. And here is an audio excerpt from their investigation titled Immensely Invisible. Marlissa was transferred to Glades County Detention Center. And she found that her experience in ICE detention was even worse than prison. The county, you never had to worry about voyeurism or none of that. You never had to worry about sharing no shower and touch, like none of that. And then I came to Glades, and I was like, what? She says that the bathrooms were open and that she had heard from other women that the guards had a direct view of what was going on in the bathroom. Do you used to see the shot, the shot of it, of like their head, that you could see it was a male. And how often did this happen? Like every day. They never fixed the issue. And joining us now from Washington, D.C., with more on this investigation is foreign affairs producer for the PBS NewsHour, Zabo Warsi. Um, Ms. Warsi, thank you so much for joining us. And first of all, we just heard a clip from Marlisa's story in the podcast. What has stood out to you about her experience? Marlisa, Marlisa's story is very, very important to how this investigation really unfolds. This woman has been detained in ICE detention for nearly two years in different detention centers, and I have been in touch with her for one and a half years. She was first detained at a Florida facility, the Glades County de Detention Center, and she experienced sexual harassment by the psychiatrist there, alleged sexual harassment. She, she filed a complaint along with other women at the facility to civil rights and civil liberties, which is a department within the Homeland Security Department, uh, against uh, the psychiatrists and the sexual harassment that they were facing while they were going to the clinic. She also complained about sexual voyeurism, open showers. You heard her talk about that uh, in that clip that you just played. And then after she complained, one second, I'm so sorry. Can we do that again? No, uh, continue. We're, we're with you. Okay. You heard her say, you heard her talk about that in that clip that you just played. And after she complained, not much was done about it. And that's what really stood out to me, not just in her complaint, but in many other complaints that we've, we've examined in public records that we've accessed, in other testimonies of survivors from across the country. Marlissa was transferred from Glades to Baker County Detention Center. And at Baker, she faces similar sexual voyeurism, similar uh, abuse, and she complains again. And she was warned by officials within the facility that if you keep making noise, you will be deported. You could face more retaliation. And that's and, what ended uh, up happening. Well, you focus on several women, but how widespread might, uh, might this be? Instances of, uh, of alleged uh, sexual assaults, uh, voyeurism, and so forth. And that's what really stands out in this investigation, Phil, that this, this is not the story of just Marlissa or Viviana or Mari the women that we profiled in the podcast. This is what really comes across 
uh, after we examined hundreds of complaints of sexual assault and sexual abuse that were filed by immigrants detained in detention centers across the country. This is not a problem that is isolated to one facility or one state. It seems to be a systemic issue that has emerged in our investigation. And I teamed up with Maria Inosa and her investigations into the subject in 2011 with And what we found after so many years is that not only but the fact that it's happening with a certain amount of impunity, that there, there still is lack of accountability, and that most of these complaints are not thoroughly being investigated. And that is what we hope to change uh, after our story. Well, as you uh, may know, here in Chicago, the Civilian Office of Police Accountability, or COPA, is currently undergoing an investigation into whether police officers engaged in sexual misconduct with migrants sleeping at police stations, uh, but it has yet to identify any victims. What makes migrants so visible in situations like this? That's a very good question. Phil, in our investigation as well, uh, in, you know, after examining those 308 complaints that were filed between 2015 and 2021 by immigrants detained in ICE facilities, a majority of those complaints were making allegations against ICE guards, contractual guards, ICE employees, detention officers, private prison officers. So these are all officers and people who are in a position of power and authority who are meant to protect these people who were in detention centers. And these allegations of sexual abuse and sexual assaults are being made against them. And the, the whole angle of abuse of authority uh, really, really comes to the fore. And immigrants who are held in ICE detention centers are extremely vulnerable. They do not enjoy legal rights like most American citizens do. If they are held in prisons, you, are, you have access to pro bono legal aid. But immigrants who are detained in ICE facilities do not have that right. So most of these immigrants are detained in remote facilities, uh, far off from their cities, far off from any relative or family member. It's not easy for legal, uh, legal aid to reach them, for free legal aid to reach them. And all of that really complicates the problem even more and makes them extremely more vulnerable uh, to assault and abuse. And when they do complain, they say that their complaints are not being investigated. So how is ICE reacting to these complaints? I have been in touch with the ICE media department since 2021, and I have been asking them for specific data. I've been asking them for specific responses on all of these allegations that have come up in our investigation. We've got a standard response from ICE, that ICE has a quote-unquote zero tolerance towards sexual abuse, and it does everything uh, and follows due procedure. But beyond that, uh, in in hundreds of complaints that we've accessed, in testimonies and interviews that we've conducted, I've interviewed at least a dozen survivors of sexual abuse and abuse in detention uh, over the last two years. And all of these people are making similar allegations. They don't really know each other. They're perhaps held in different detention centers, but they say, they do tell us that there is a pattern of abuse in detention. There is a use of solitary confinement as a retaliation that has been adopted. There are patterns of invasive pat down searches, intrusive pat down searches, invasive touching of genitals, uh, groping, sexual abuse and sexual assault. These complaints are strikingly similar and they, they tell us that this is a systemic issue. And ICE has failed uh, to really respond to those questions and has failed to truly tackle the, the problem of accountability that remains. Zeba Orsi, thank you so much for your insights. We appreciate it. Thank you very much. Thank you for having me. And you can listen to the full, pod, full podcast, Immensely Invisible, on Latino USA. And you can read the full investigation at futuroinvestigates.org. And up next, capturing life in Cuba and a new photo exhibit. So stay with us. When you picture Cuba, you might picture cigars, vintage cars, and weather-beaten buildings. But to photographer Alex Garcia, that would not be anywhere near a full portrait. A Chicago native, Garcia has been traveling to and documenting Cuba for nearly 30 years, visiting family, leading photography tours, and working as a photojournalist. Now his work is being featured in a solo show at the recently opened Chicago Center for Photojournalism. Chicago Tonight's Nick Blumberg paid a visit. 
Alex Garcia first visited his family in Cuba in 1995. I was really propelled to go there for the first time to see them because it was right after the Balseros crisis where people were basically jumping into the ocean. Thousands of Cubans on rafts and boats were fleeing to the United States. But despite being spurred by that crisis, and despite the fraught political history between the two countries, Garcia says he's pretty nonpartisan. I think the only time that people ever really hear about Cuba is maybe more in a political context. The more that we get to know each other as people, the more that we get to know each other as neighbors, I mean, I think that we'll have greater intersections of understanding and, uh, and appreciation. After his first trip in 1995, Garcia returned as an exchange student and eventually worked as a photojournalist when the Chicago Tribune opened a Havana bureau. The pictures I was looking for might have had more of a news angle to them. And because of that, I kind of had them more in black and white to emphasize the content. And then over time, they're more colorful, they're more about people, and they're more appreciative of just the, the culture as a whole. Garcia's pictures allow the humanity of his subjects to shine, free of preconceived notions. The show has celebratory moments as big as a fireworks show and as small as the back of a car. And it doesn't shy away from the harsh conditions many Cubans face, like a once well-off mother and son with little left beyond one another. Photojournalism is at its best when it tells stories that allows people to understand complex issues uh, in a way that they may not have understood. It requires a lot of uh, guts, tenacity, uh, and there's very little support for photojournalists today. Denise Keim is a longtime street photographer and educator. She opened the Chicago Center for Photojournalism earlier this year in an uptown storefront. It was really important for me to bring art and this back down to the street level, just like the bodega and the butcher and the uh, beauticians in the coffee shops. In addition to exhibiting photographers' work, Kimes teaching street photography, the ethics of photojournalism, and hosting a lecture series. She's also planning an after-school series with local high schools. For Kime, the center is a way to make these important images last. The old saying was, uh, your photo was in the newspaper and the next day it's in the kitty litter box, right? So um, I'm really concentrating on long-term projects that photojournalists have been working on for long periods of time. Alex Garcia's decades of photos certainly fit that bill. Since leaving the Tribune, he's opened a video production company and he runs workshops in Cuba, taking groups on photography tours. We're staying in uh, in people's homes, we're eating at restaurants run by private citizens, and it's really just a, a really great opportunity to get close to the warmth and the openness of the Cuban people. For Chicago Tonight Latino Voices, I'm Nick Blumberg. The show Enduring Ties, Resilience and Longing in Cuba by photographer Alex Garcia runs through September 15th. We have more information on our website. Well, it's going to be a full weekend of vendors, artists, and food at the Fiesta del Sol Festival in Pilsen. This year, organizers are celebrating 51 years of a festival that spans an eight-block space down Cermak Road. More than 100 booths are expected, and according to organizers, planning has taken at least a year. Here's a look at what you can expect. We have a super fun and packed weekend. It's going to be hot, and so we're excited. We're called Fiesta del Sol, and so the sun is out. Um, I'm excited to see everyone uh, return to the, the festival. We have um, over uh, 50 vendors. We have two stages of entertainment, our main stage uh, on Morgan and Cermak and our second stage at the park, Dvorak Park. We're going to have some karaoke. We're going to have a folklorico fiesta, um, a little bit of everything, Mexican bands, local bands, and, of course, a delicious food, the tacos, pambazos, enchiladas, and a little bit of everything. This festival came out of grassroots movements in the Pilsen community, um, thanks to local leaders, students, and the community that came together to uh, demand the building of Benito Juarez High School. And so through that celebration, it became a block party. And then over the, the years, we're now celebrating 51 years of that initial block party, which is now a mile-long festival. And so definitely one of a kind, family-friendly, alcohol-free, um, and made for the community. 
outside of that we also have our Paseo de las Expos or our expositions which um, has different expos and different topics so we're recovering um, immigration housing uh, keeping healthy uh, college week and college day so there's many resources outside of what we're doing in the festival that are also very beneficial to the community the festival runs through Sunday and admission is free. You can find more information on our website. And that is our show tonight. Be sure to check out WTTW.com slash news for the latest, very latest from WTTW News. And while you're there, check out our summer festival guide. And be sure to join Brandis Friedman this Monday at noon for our next virtual Chicago Tonight Voices community conversation. We'll be discussing public safety and the impact of systemic violence on everyday life. Again, that's Monday, July 31st at noon to RSVP. Visit WTTW.com slash events. Now for all of us here at Chicago Tonight, Latino Voices, I'm Phil Ponce, and I thank you for watching. Closed captioning is made possible by Robert A. Clifford and Clifford Law Offices, a Chicago personal injury and wrongful death firm, and proud sponsor of programming that offers advice and strategies to enhance the physical and mental well-being of fellow legal practitioners in Illinois. The fall of the Berlin Wall in 1989. I don't have even the English words to explain how I feel. It was the beginning of the end for the Cold War. Gorbachev saw there was no way of resisting it. Inspiring the people of other communist countries to revolt. His execution was shown on television. The story of how it happened. I have been dreaming of this for years. The 100 Days.